Hi, I'm Jeff Spurgeon from WQXR. Welcome to WQXR's Facebook Live. This is an extraordinary, extraordinary occasion that we have two artists of such incredible accomplishment and talent right here to perform for you in the middle of the day on a New York City Wednesday. The tenor, Mark Padmore, who is renowned for the beautiful purity of his sound and yet a deep emotionality in his performances, and pianist Paul Lewis, who is famous for great imaginative playing and a gorgeous technique. They have teamed up before in New York to sing Schubert song cycles, but they're here in the city now to perform at Avery Fisher Hall tomorrow night, and they've turned their attention to Schumann and Brahms. The thing that links the two composers is the poetry of Heinrich Heine. So they're going to do both of the Schumann Heine song cycles, the Liederkreis and the Dichterliebe, and then a half dozen Brahms songs as well. And they've come here today to share a sampling of these works with you. So we'll start with the opening three songs from Sch uh, uh, Schumann's Liederkreis. So it's Mark Padmore and Paul Lewis for you, live from WQXR. Wir 
Würfelglein gefangen, das hübsche goldene Wort. Das sollt ihr mir nicht erzählen, ihr Vöglein wunderschlau. Ihr wollt meinen Kummer mir stillen. Ich habe niemanden trau. Ich habe Give you that one. You. Three songs from Schumann's Liederkreis. Uh, tenor Mark Padmore, pianist Paul Lewis. Uh, Mr. Lewis, grab that uh, device there and, and talk a little bit, if you will, about Schumann's wonderful close. You get to sing the last words of the text, but very often in these songs, Schumann, I don't know, he carries the thought forward. It's not even, he's not even necessarily setting up the next tune. What, I, what, is the, what are those little instrumental codas? Yeah, the, the, the playouts can be quite elaborate with, with Schumann, also with, with, uh, with Dichtelieber, which we're, we're doing tomorrow, even more so, I think. Um, and the, the piano writing is fascinating, really. I mean, it sort of turns into a, 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 almost a piano piece uh, at the end. And he does take, he takes the, certainly takes the thoughts forward. But it's interesting that... You know, with Schumann, emotionally and expressively, there's always so much going on, so many, so many layers. And the, physically, the piano writing is, it sort of mirrors that. It's quite, it, it's not very pianistic. It doesn't sit easily under the fingers, and you have to, to balance and, and um, coordinate many different things going on all at the same time. I've wondered if these pieces are actually easier to play on an older piano, something that would have been more of Schumann's time, that maybe the modern piano allows emphasis on, on sounds that make his music a little harder to, to bring out those darker and inner textures? Yeah, well, I think it's swings and roundabouts to, to some extent. There are, there are some things that are going to be easier to play. Of course, the older pianos have lighter actions and shallower keys, and that, that makes them easy to play. But, but um, of course, the modern instrument has a, a different range of color, a different set of, of, of colors, and gives you sort of other, other possibilities. So I think it's, you know, both have their advantages. Right. The link, as I mentioned, in this program you're doing of, of Schumann and Brahms is Heinrich Heine. Is it the songs or the, or the poetry that sort of drew you guys to, to these things? I mean, I guess you can't separate the two, but Heine's the link. Yeah, I think if you want to perform Schumann, it's, it's actually kind of hard to avoid Heine. <laughs> um, uh, he set him uh, really a lot of times, also in, in the song cycle Merton, um, the, 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 the Heiner Liederkreis and, and Dichterliebe. Uh, the, the, I mean, I think there's an extraordinary, well, 1840 was, was when, when Schumann had this extraordinary year of song. Um, and he, he suddenly writes 140 songs, having only written piano music <laughs> before that. It's just crazy to yeah. think about. No, no, I mean, it, and, and, you know, they were pouring out of him. But it's a, it's a very interesting year in, in his life. I mean, it, it's the year that he finally gets to marry Clara Wieck. Um, the daughter of his piano teacher, Clara Wieck, is one of the great pianists of the of the nineteenth century, um, and she is a sort of she's already um, well established. She started playing really recitals when she was eleven, 
Um, and, and she goes on to be one of the most important pianists of the, of the century. But, but they're living apart in this, in this year. She's, she's away in, in Berlin or on tour. And, and her father is not happy about his, the idea of this his, the, Her father is absolutely dead against it. And, and, uh, and Robert is in Leipzig writing this music and then sending it to her. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's, what, again, has, uh, it's really why the piano writing is so extraordinary, is because um, essentially he's, he's writing music that, that he wants her to understand. Um, and she will then presumably sit at the piano and play it and, and probably sing it as well. I mean, the other thing I think it's interesting to remember about this music is uh, there, was, there wasn't a performance of, of Dichterliebe, um, which we'll do tomorrow night, in its entirety until the 1860s, long after Schumann had died. Um, playing the piano on that occasion was Johannes Brahms, um, which uh, has an, is another sort of interesting connection, um, and, uh, and a, a baritone called Julius Stockhausen. Um, but, but, you know, this, this music was, was written, it, it was to be read um, in, in many ways, not even more th than be performed, I think. You know, it was, it's poetry, it's, it's the way that you, you, you sort of make sense of, of a poetic language. Um, and, that, and that is often by sort of, you know, that intimate relationship of, of reading something rather than necessarily even than performing it. Mm. Mark Padmore and Paul Lewis, I'm going to stop. We could talk more, but you've also agreed to sing some more for us. So we've started the Lied of Christ, but now we're going to finish it. So the last two songs from that cycle with these two great artists here at WQXR. Yes. 
Concluding moments from Schumann's Leader Christ with tenor Mark Padmore and pianist Paul Lewis. Um, we didn't provide translations. You can look the poems up yourself. They're not necessarily day brighteners. This music, German romanticism, I, I always boil it down to I'm in love and I've never been more miserable in all my life. That's an oversimplification, but these, there's a lot of dark emotion in, in this music. So do you go to that place? Are you just acting, Mark? Do you absorb it and, and can you shake it off or does it stay with you? I think, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is acting to a certain extent. I think you, you've got to get inside it. I, I love this poetry. I think it's, um, it, it, particularly the, this, this song cycle seems to me all about separation. I mean, it, you know, even the, the end, the last song is about, about sending songs to the, to the distant beloved. The distant beloved was a great sort of trope in, in, in this, this period. That Beethoven writes Andy Ferner um, you know, o on that. Um, but but th th there is a sort of, I think the emotional content in many ways is carried in the, in the, in the piano writing. Um, and that often in Schumann, the, the vocal lines are actually not that interesting. They, they, they're, they're, they're quite often your, your melody is not actually sort of as, as sort of fine as, as what's going on in the piano. And I think it's really important to balance the listening um, uh, in, in the, the experience but, um, uh, in, 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 the, in the leader repertoire. It's not all about the voice. I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, however much we might sort of admire the great, sing the great leader singers of the past, the Fischer Discals and, and whatever. There's some in the present too. Some, <laughs> some in the present too. But I think that really you should, th there's, there's three elements. There's, th there's the words, there's the voice, and there's the, there's the music which is being carried in the, pi in the piano writing. And Often the piano writing is exceptional. I mean, it's some of the great piano repertoire. I think um, in 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 all of uh, in, in all of this song repertoire. So, so I think it is quite important to, to get that balance sort of a little adju adjusted. I appreciate that you suggest that the listener has to do some of that as well. That's just wonderful. So then let's talk about how another composer takes texts by this same poet and applies his technique to them. Brahms. You're going to do a couple of Brahms songs uh, for us today and a half a dozen on the program you'll do tomorrow night at Alice Tully Hall. There are a few tickets remaining, I'm told. If you want to grab some now, it might be a good time. Paul, how does, how does Brahms treat the piano in his settings for songs of poetry by Heine? Well, very differently compared to Schumann. Um, I was saying before about Schumann being quite counterintuitive pianistically and physically. He doesn't always go <coughs> where you expect him to. Um, Brahms is, is, is different. He, he sits quite comfortably under the hand, in a way. Um, it, it's, it's like you know, the, the way he writes, if you look at his piano music, if you, if you play through his piano music, you feel that he sort of writes in blocks, you know, in pianistic blocks. And, and the, the, the writing for the, for the songs is, is 
was pretty much along those lines, really. It feels very similar. It's, it's a little more transparent. You know, it's not as, as big as some of the, I mean, if you look at pieces like the Third Sonata, it's, it's, it's like a, a, a full orchestra, really, <laughs> the way he writes for piano. It's not, it's not quite like that. So he is more transparent, but it, it, essentially it's, it's a very similar way of writing for the piano. Are the melodies, what's different about, about the vocal lines in the Brahms uh, uh, from the Schumann? Yeah, I think you, you, it requires sort of more singing um, in, in a way. I think it is, it's is—it's got that sort of lyrical content. I mean, I think there's a great sense of anxiety in the Schumann songs, and which I think it was to do with the situation he was writing them in. Um, and uh, the Brahms, you know, he, he, they're setting the same poet, but, but essentially Brahms seems to be much more comfortable with it. And there's a sense that, that even in the sort of the minor keys and the... Uh, the, the, the uh, that there's a closeness, there's a sort of, uh, of the beloved. The beloved is actually sort of there. Um, Ironic, too, because well, Schumann got his beloved and Brahms never had one. Well, except that Brahms, of course, was desperately in love as well with Clara Wieck. Um, I mean, there's, there's a, a great... Yeah, sort the of whole mystery there. In, right. s in sort of, you know, incestuous sort of side to all of this. I mean, uh, and, and Brahms wrote these songs essentially after Schumann's death, but, but I'm, I'm sure he was thinking about Sch Robert Schumann, but he was writing them and they were being commented on by Clara. Um, and, uh, but I do think, I think there's a sort of a, a lyrical quality to it. I mean, I, I hear the piano writing as being quite orchestral in, in certain ways. You know, there's, there's w wonderful ways in which the, the inner melodies of the, the piano writing really sort of um, m meld with, with, with what's going on in the voice. So the two songs we have, uh, the first one is called Sea Voyage, and again, it's about, um, about, it's a, about a separation and, and uh, a looking for a connection in that. And the second one is, is beautiful. Der Tod das ist die kühle Nacht. Death is a cool night. It's a beautiful poem. And we're going to hear both of these now from tenor Mark Padmore and pianist Paul Lewis. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Two songs by Brahms, the setting of uh, poetry of Heinrich Heine, performed by tenor Mark Padmore, and pianist Paul Lewis, who are in New York for a concert that will include the works you've heard on this uh, particular Facebook Live program and more, music by Schumann and Brahms, tomorrow night uh, as part of Lincoln Center's great performer series, the recital taking place uh, at Alice Tully Hall. And then these gentlemen will hie themselves to uh, Easton, Pennsylvania, to perform Schubert's Winterreise at the Williams Center at Lafayette College on Saturday. And then there are other things ahead. You are doing some new music in the near future, Mark Pepp? Yeah, just one of the sort of things I've been doing recently is quite a lot of um, newly composed music. Um, I have an opera by a uh, young British composer called Tansy Davis uh, coming up in June. And then I'm going to the um, Bregenz Festival in, in Austria to perform a new piece by Thomas Lacher, um, uh, which, uh, yeah, both of which are, both <laughs> are rather exciting and uh, will take quite a lot of work over the next few months. <laughs> is, that a, is that a refreshment for you to do new music? Is that part of your sort of philosophy of being a performer? A little, a little bit of the old, a little bit of the new? Or, or is, it, is it just your, your whim and your pleasure? Um, I love the line from T.S. Eliot, we shall not cease from exploration, <laughs> which was, um, is, is kind of um, what I try to do. I, I think, you know, either way, if you're looking at a piece you know well, you know, Vinter Eisen, Paul and I performed quite a number of times now, um, or the Matthew Passion, which I've done many, many times, you, you, there's, there's never an end to, to what you can do with these pieces or what you can discover inside them. Um, so essentially, yeah, uh, um, the, the, the I, I, th that sense of exploration is, is always there. But with new music, it's a special challenge. You, know, you don't have a recording to listen to. You, you've got to sort of make sense of it yourself. YouTube is of no help. N absolutely none at it all. It seems evil, in a way. <laughs> it seems evil. Paul Lewis, what's ahead for you um, in the next uh, interval, shall we say? Uh, well, I'm um, partway into a, a four-recital, four-program series of Haydn, Beethoven, and Brahms that I'm doing this season and next. 
Um, so all the late, the late Brahms sets, Haydn sonatas, and Beethoven bagatelles and Diabelli variations. That's that's my main project for these. There's a lot days. of there's a lot of pleasure in there. I guess that if you want the dark side of that, that's that's the Brahms. But Haydn is just endlessly delightful at the keyboard. Uh, Haydn is just is wonderful and and sadly still a bit neglected. Really, it doesn't uh, pop up on. Uh, recital programs as often as it perhaps um, should. You'll but, but help fix that. Well, yes. I mean, it's it's it, you know Haydn really is one of the few composers that can make an audience laugh out loud. That's right. And you know that th there's it's just it's wonderful music. It's surprising. It's creative, and it's it's so engaging to listen to. And you'll be back this summer for mostly Mozart. I'm back in the states in the summer for mostly Mozart and and Tanglewood as well. Very yeah. good. Well, we'll look for you then. Gentlemen, it's such an incredible pleasure and really a privilege for us to have you with us today and to get this preview of your recital at, uh, at Alice Tully Hall tomorrow, uh, uh, tomorrow night. So thank you both, tenor Mark Padmore, Paul Lewis, a great privilege to have them here. And thank you so much for joining us for this special Facebook Live presentation from WQXR. Uh, keep an eye out. We'll be back with more of these performances as time goes by. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>